Good evening. Thank you, Father Dan, for the invitation and for the very nice introduction. As I said, with that introduction, all the more I got scared. <laughs> I don't really plan to give like very deep reflections tonight. The most important thing for us is as we enter, we all know that this Sunday is already Palm Sunday, which means it's already Holy Week. Now, of course, we know that Holy Week, especially the three important days in the Holy Week, we call that as the Paschal Triduum, is the highest part of our year in the church, right? Normally, when you ask people, what is the most important feast in the church, the most celebrated, normally people will say, Christmas Father, right? Because a lot of people during Christmas Day. But of course, we know that really, in our liturgical year, in the calendar of the church, the highest point of the year is Easter Sunday. Or just allow me to say, the Paschal Triduum, the three important days. Holy Thursday in the evening, Good Friday, Saturday, until of course, Easter Vigil or Easter Sunday. But of course, as I said, we don't really plan to give very long or Found reflection tonight, the most important thing is that we are able to gather together and of course dispose ourselves for the celebration of Holy Week, especially of the Paschal Triduum. And of course, as we said, this is Lenten reflection. And we know that when we are talking about Lent, that means this is the time of the year when we remember and we reflect on what? Lenten season? What do we reflect upon? Lenten season. Suffering and death of the Lord. Because of course, when we say Easter, we are reflecting and celebrating the resurrection. But when we say Paschal Triduum, those three together are really are put together in the Paschal Triduum. You have suffering, death, and resurrection of the Lord. But when you're only talking about land, then you're talking about suffering and death. And I was thinking, since we are reflecting on the suffering and death of the Lord in the Lenten season, I thought that the story about the prodigal son would help us bring into light really what we reflect upon, what's the mystery we celebrate in the Lenten season. It is taken from the Gospel of St. Luke. Does anybody remember what chapter? It's chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. Actually, it's until the end of chapter 15 of the Gospel of St. Luke. We are told, Jesus said in the parable, there was a man who had how many sons? He had two sons. Now, of course, if you have two sons, obviously, one will be the eldest, the other one is the youngest. And then the story goes that the youngest son one day approached the father and the request of the son is, what was the request of the son? Father, Give me the share of the estate that should come to me. In short, he is asking for his share in the inheritance. Now, my dear friends, at first glance, there seems to be no problem with the request, right? Because in the, at the end of the day, he was, he was asking for his share of the inheritance. That's why it's called inheritance. It should actually belong to him. But what is wrong or what is foul in the request is this. What's wrong about that? He was asking for his share of the inheritance while the father was still alive. You know, every time I, I reflect on this gospel, I know that Ray is videotaping this. I think, I hope my mother doesn't watch this video when he posts it. Every time I reflect on this story, I'm always reminded of one particular event in my life as a son. I remember I was in the high school seminary already. It was vacation time and I was going one afternoon home and from a distance I could hear shouting. Two people arguing. Lo and behold, when, God, when I got inside the house, it was my brother and my sister. They were fighting. And what were they arguing about? They were fighting over inheritance. Both of them would like already to take their share of the inheritance. Now, mind you, my dear brothers and sisters, my father died at the very young age. My father died at the age of 42. I was only 8 years old when my father died. And I have a younger brother and a younger sister. When my father died, my youngest brother, he was less than 2 years old. And you know how many children there in the family? 
We're only eight. We're only eight. So can you imagine my mom surviving all of us, eight of us? And that time when that happened, my father was already long gone. I was already in high school. When he died, I was only eight years old. And so when I entered the house and I heard my brother and sister fighting, and they were fighting over inheritance, they wanted to take their share of their, of their inheritance, I saw my mom at the corner of the house quietly sobbing and crying. And so I approached my mom and said, Mom, what's wrong? It's them fighting, not me. And what did she say? Oh, they are fighting over inheritance and asking for their share, even though I'm still alive. That means, son, that for them, I'm already dead. That they don't need me anymore. Because for you to ask for your inheritance while your parents are still alive, it's like declaring to them, they are for you already dead. I want to get out of this house. I want to take my share of inheritance and go somewhere else. It's different when your parents voluntarily give it huh, when they're alive. If you're a parent and you want to say, okay, son, I want you to put up your business. I'm already giving you. That's different. Than for you to be the son or to be the daughter, getting your share of inheritance while they're still alive. And not only that, my dear brothers and sisters, remember that we are talking of the Jewish culture, of the Hebrew culture, which is the context of the story. You know, for us, right, when you talk of inheritance and you don't want your children to be fighting over inheritance when you die, what do you do? What do you do to make sure that, oh, when I die, they will not be fighting over inheritance? You write your last will and testament. You have to say, oh, this house goes to this child, this car goes to this child, this business goes to that. You divide your property by writing your last will and testament. But for the Jews, my dear brothers and sisters, you don't even need to do that. Of course, we have laws about inheritance, but the Jews, they are very, very strict when it comes to inheritance. You don't even need to write your last will and testament because the Jewish laws will take care of that. Mind you, I can see the crowd, I'm looking at the crowd, a lot of you are attending my Bible class. Remember that in the scriptures, right, in the Bible, in the Jewish culture, the eldest son plays a very important role because in the Jewish culture, the eldest son plays the role of being the second father in the family. In fact, when the father dies in the Jewish culture, the eldest son takes the position or authority of being the father. That's why in the Jewish culture, when the father dies, you know how much of the property goes to the eldest son? Okay, make a guess. What do you think? So it's not only father giving the information. What do you think? In the Jewish law, when the father dies or the parents die, two-thirds of the property automatically goes to the eldest son. Two-thirds. Now, think about this. In the prodigal son story, who asked for the share of inheritance? The youngest son. Between the two sons, who has the right over the inheritance, the property? The oldest son. And yet it was the youngest son who asked for his share of the property. Not only that, once he had already the property, his share of inheritance, what did he do? He took all his belongings and went somewhere else and spent the property in his inheritance on not really good things. How do you feel if you're a father, you work hard, earn all of those things, you had double, triple job just to have those property, and then your son gets his share and leaves, brings, him, brings the property, the, that amount, with him, and spends it not in a nice way. How do you feel? Huh? How do you think? You are already feeling bad because the son got his share of the property while still alive. And between the two sons, it's even the youngest son who asked for his share of the inheritance. Between the two, is the eldest was the right. And aside from that, he even spent the money on the wrong reasons. If he built something, and then that something was used for the wrong reasons, how do you feel? 
It's a disrespect, a destruction of what you have built. That's why, my dear brothers and sisters, in our story, to cut it short, in the story about the prodigal son, it is projected that the son, the youngest son, committed the greatest sin you can ever do to a father in the Jewish culture. Okay? There can be nothing graver than the son's sin in the prodigal, the story of the prodigal son. He committed the gravest sin he could ever commit to against his father. In fact, if you notice in the story, he knows that very well. Why? What happened to him? After leaving, getting his share of the inheritance, lived somewhere else, spent his property, everything, until he lost everything, what happened to him? Life was difficult. To the point of working. What was his work? What was his work? Feeding pig, pigs, right? Now, have you ever thought why of all the work that is given by the story in the prodigal son, it's feeding the, the swine? Why do you think? Why not farmer, father, that's given by the... Remember, this is a story written, huh? Why do you think feeding the pigs? Why not being a farmer? I'll do this, I'll do that. Why, why feeding the swine? Because remember, the context is, they were Jewish. Hebrew. Remember, they're not allowed to touch pigs. Are you following me? That means, that's why the writer of the story chose really the work that is, you know, that the son entered, taking care of the pigs. It tells us, the writer is telling us that the son is really so desperate. He would go against the law just to survive. He would be willing even to take care of pigs. That's how low or great his situation was. That he was willing to do everything just to survive. Life, that means, is really difficult for him. In fact, even though he was already taking care of pigs, remember? He just wanted to eat the pods that the pig would eat. Was he given? No. And so when he was already in that situation, what happened to him? The Gospel of St. Luke beautifully puts it. What does Luke say? Coming to his senses. Yeah, in Filipino, he said, Sa kapanatauhan. Okay. Sometimes we are like that, right? I mean, when we reflect on the story, we always say, even me, when I reflect on the story, I always say, How could that son do that? How could he afford to do that to his father? But come to think of it, we just have to face the mirror and realize we're the same thing. How many times have we offended our father? And not only our father, how many times have we offended our parents, both of them? And worst of course, how much we have offended God. Remember, any sin that we commit against a neighbor is a sin against God. But when life becomes difficult, only then do we come to our senses. That's why the son, coming to his senses, he realized, wait a minute. Here I am. I have nothing to eat. I, I am even willing to eat even just the pods that the pigs would eat. It's not even given to me. But in the house of my father, the servants have more than enough to eat. How many friends? Remember, we are Catholics, we are Christians. What does that tell us? Come on, what does that tell us? In my father's house, the servants even have more than, more than enough to eat. What does that mean? Just go ahead, Father, before we really completely close our eyes. Huh? Don't you see in our life, we always say, for some reasons, the, but the forbidden things are the good things. In Filipino, we say, ang bawal maging masarap. Or how do you say it? Sometimes we enjoy doing bad things, forgetting that there is something 
better in my father's house. Just think about this. How many Catholics are within the territory of Santa Barbara? How many do you think? How many thousands? Guam is 150, they say, right? Well, let's just say Santa Barbara, since this is the biggest and most populated parish, they say, let's just say 10,000, right? Let's just say 10,000. You think so? 10,000? How many come to us? Huh? How many come to us on Sundays? 2,000? Huh? Cannot even say 2,000? 3,000? What does that mean? What does that mean? We seem to be enjoying something. The 7,000, if you say 3,000, seems to be enjoying life. Hey, go and go, enjoying life away from the house of the Father. When life becomes living, all what happens? Call the priest and die. I always tell those who, you know, when I'm called for anointing of the sick, when I go to the hospital, I always ask the doctor, what's the situation? Oh, Father, not good. Just waiting. So, I always ask my friend who contacts me what. So that's why they ask for the priest, right? Yes, Father. So this is not anointing of the sick, because anointing of the sick is really for the healing. But if this person is really dying, then we do the commendation for the dying. I have my own experience, a very close cousin of mine. When I was newly ordained a priest, every time I go home, does nothing but argue with me. Why do you believe in it? Life is easy, look at this. One time I went home and my mom said, as soon as I arrived home, she said, oh, your cousin blah 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 is asking for you. I said, what? I don't want to argue. No, he's dying. We seem to be enjoying like this son. I don't want to be in the house of my father. Give me my share. And then I'll go. And then when life becomes difficult, nothing to eat anymore. That's when we remember God. Look at the son, when he had the money from his father, I don't need my father, give me my share, I'm leaving. But when life was difficult, only then did he come into his senses. My dear friends, I hope we are not like that. Huh? I hope we are always in our senses. But you know the beautiful thing about the story is this. Notice the son. The son... It's different when the son realizes, Oh, life is difficult here. I have nothing to eat, even the pots I'm not given. But in my father's house, the servants even have more than enough they need for their food. I am going back to the house of my father. That's different. Okay? That's different in the sense that he saw the difference between his situation here and what's the situation in his father's house. Another thing is realizing how great the sin he has committed. Huh? What does he say? He said, coming to his senses, he thought, how many of my father's hard workers have more than enough food to eat, but here am I dying from hunger. I shall get up and go to my father and shall say to him, listen to this, Beautiful. He says, Father, I am sinned against heaven and against you. That's why as I tell you, any sin that we commit, always remember this. Whatever sin we commit against a brother or a sister is against is a sin against God. And he says, I no longer deserve to be called your son. Okay. What does that tell us? That the son is aware that he has committed the gravest sin ever. 
he can commit against his father. He is aware that he is not worthy to be called a son anymore. Okay? That's why this son, he was not going home to his father to be a son. Why is he going back to his father? Survival issue. At least there's food there. I'll apply for job. Because he knows it himself, he is not worthy anymore. In fact, okay? in fact, the son, being aware of the great sin he has committed against his father, what did he say? Obviously, he is afraid of the father. He must be thinking, how will my father be up when I go home? That's why he says here, I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as you would treat one of your hard workers. So he got up and went back to his father. In fact, in the story, notice, he would even rehearse what he's gonna say. Right? The Gospel of St. Luke tells us, this is what I shall say to him. Now, I hope, I hope looking at the crowd, we can relate with this. Nowadays, courtship is very easy, right? Because of the cell phone. Yeah? Just text message, hi, I like you, I saw you this morning, uh, in class, uh, in the classrooms. Uh, oh, after how many days, they're already lovers. Huh? But remember during your time, uh, I excluded myself. Remember <laughs> in the provinces, in the, in the, during the time when there was not, no cell phone yet, no computer, right? Remember, landline only, right? You're even very rich already if you have landline, right? So if you are going to visit the house of what you like or you love, what do you do? Going to the house? Those who experience this, you rehearse, right? This is what I'm gonna do. When I get to their house, this is how I'm gonna knock. I know their house is, the door is like this. And then when the door opens, this is what I'm gonna say. And then when she goes out, I'm gonna say, good afternoon. You rehearse. Why are you rehearsing? Why? I can see some smiling. I think you can relate, right? Why did you rehearse? Because father, once the door opens, because you rehearse, you say, if it is the father who opens, this is what I'm gonna say. If it is the mother who opens, this is what I'm gonna say. If the brother or sister, or if it is her who opens, this is what I'm gonna say. Why do you rehearse? Scared. Once the door is open and you did not rehearse, forget it. You don't know what to say. You'll just melt there. You're so scared that you rehearse. That's why the son here rehearsed. He knows that he has offended the father so much. He knows that he doesn't deserve to be a son anymore. That's why he rehearsed. He said, when I go back, this is what I'm gonna say. Father, I have sinned against God and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as one of your men. He knows it. He's aware of how much sin he has committed against his father. But the more beautiful part is this. The Gospel of St. Luke tells us, while he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him and was filled with compassion. I don't know if it's still applicable up to our time nowadays because I know, I mean, our situation is totally different. But my, my memory of my father in our province, there was no TV yet during that time. I remember in our town, at night, at around 6 o'clock, my father will already open the radio. The Filipinos, may, perhaps you will be able to relate. Remember the basketball, the transistor, Crispa, Toyota, <laughs> I remember that, my father. And my father will be seated in the living room while the radio is open and will be reading the newspaper. Doesn't even care what's happening around the house. He just reads. He doesn't know what's happening outside. And when he needs something from you, what does he say? Van! You don't, you're not even allowed to say, Yes, Dad! Because when you say yes, it should be accompanied with running to the father, right? My father was like, what do you mean yes? Come here. Even to just say yes, 
is for us during the time already very disrespectful. When you say yes, you will be, yes, God, you're moving. And he doesn't even look at you. Oh, may he rest in peace. My father died at a very young age because uh, he's alcoholic. But, yes, God, buy me tanduay. He ask you to do something. He doesn't even look at you. And that's just how it is. It's not being disrespectful as a father. As a father, he's a typical father. who just stays there, you know, and you run to the father. But what do you notice with the father in the story? The gospel of St. Luke tells us, while he was away, far off, the father caught sight of him. Because, because as they say, from the very moment, obviously, that the son left the house, the father was ready, waiting. You know, this reminds me of, remember in our Bible class, remember Cain? Who is Cain again? Our neighbor father. Cain, the first son of Adam. Remember when he was punished by God? And God said, you'll be punished from the garden, Cain, because you killed your brother. And then Cain said, what will I do if I wander around? People may kill me. Okay. What did God say? He put a mark on Cain and said, No, you will be wondering, but I'll protect you. Anybody who does evil to you, I will avenge seven times. So from the very moment that Cain was driven out of the garden, the father will get out. Again, this reminds me, that's why when I reflect on this story, it really, I'm able to relate with the story because it reminds me of a lot of incidents in my life. Because, as I said, my father died at a very young age. I don't mean anything like people want. But when my father died, we just realized that it's the father who puts the family together. It's like the one who gives order. When the father is around, nobody does to me. Okay? Everybody behaves. So imagine when my father died, one year old, four year old, then I'm third, eight year old, all the way up there. Oh, everybody's fighting. Everybody's fighting in the family. No wonder we are scattered around the world. Huh? I'm in Guam, my two siblings are in Canada, one in Switzerland, one went to Malaysia because we could not stay together. My father was gone at a very young age. One time, Ray, don't post this and I'm being troubled with my mother. <laughs> One time, my sister, who always argues with my mom, who always argues with my mom. My mom could not control it anymore. She's so fed up already, even though she's a mother. What did she do? One time she said, Can I do the house? You're not my daughter anymore. Of all, the, of all the children that for her to say that, that's the wrong child she told, she said that to the wrong child. My sister just did that, my daughter, okay, I did that. <laughs> okay, perhaps if it's me, my, my father, my mother would tell me that, get out, no, mom, please, mom, but not me. my sister, that's the wrong child that she put to, get out of the house. Oh, my sister left. You know how many years we look for her? From the very moment that my sister left, after like an hour, you know what my mom was saying? Where is she? <laughs> told my mom, you're the one who told her to get up. Find her, not me. But does that not bring a bell? Does that not bring a bell? My dear friends, land is nothing else than that. That's why 
But in the story, very beautiful, huh? in the story, what happened? He rehearsed, he was afraid going to the father. And the father from a distance caught sight of him. And the gospel of St. Luke would tell us, the father ran to him. So I could not remember, I was still in college. I was studying at St. Carlos Seminary and Cardinal Sin, of course, was the bishop during that time. I could never forget when he was, you know, Cardinal Sin is a very good storyteller if you ever had a chance of listening to him. I could never forget when he was telling us this story. He said, that's why for me, the story of the prodigal son is the story about the running father. He calls it as the running father. Because he said, typical fathers don't run to the son. The sons, the sons run to the father. Come here, buy me beer, <laughs> buy me whatever. You have to run to the father. And yet, Cardinal Sin would say, but here, it's the father running to the son. Now, you might be imagining if you're the son, wow, I saw my father running towards me. You might be imagining like, oh, slow motion. Oh my God. Don't even think of that. Go to the real context of the story. If you're the son and you saw your father from a distance running towards you, what will be your reaction? Huh? You'll be like, oh boy, I'll be dead. Why? Because he knows he has offended the father. So don't imagine it when your son is like, wow, my dog is running to me. I can even imagine the son going, shall I run away? <laughs> but no, as soon as the father reached the son, what did he do? He embraced the son. In fact, my dear brothers and sisters, he did not need to rehearse. Because in the story, before he has even uttered those words that he rehearsed, the father has already embraced him. The father has already embraced him. That's why I can imagine the son, when the father was running, like, and then when the father embraced him, he might be, Father, are you forgetting that you sinned against you? But no, the father did not even marry. Notice in the in the gospel story, the father almost like ignored whatever the son is doing. After running to the son, embraced the son, he said to the servants, quickly. Only then was the son able to say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. That's why, that's why as I said, I can imagine the son being embraced by the father. If I'll be the one writing the story, I'll be adding some phrases there to the words of the son. I'll be putting there, Father, are you forgetting I sinned against you? Do you have dementia now? You forgot how I left? I asked for my share of inheritance and everything like that. I sinned against you. But that's precisely the point of the story. That's, why, that's precisely the point of the story. That's why more and more versions of the Bible now do not use anymore the word the prodigal son. A few Bibles now you will see that the title already is The Loving Father. Because the point of the story is not really the sin of the son. The point of the story is the great love of the father. The sinfulness of the son is just being used by the writer to show us how much the love of the father is to his son. He has to make a contrast. It's like, it's like saying, see how much sin the son has committed against the father and yet in spite of how grave the sin is, the father is willing to forgive him. That's why the love of the father is greater than the sin of the son. Have you ever thought, why would Jesus become man? And why would Jesus suffer and die on the cross? Why? If it will be means like, Lord, have you forgotten? I'm the one who sinned. Why do you have to? We don't deserve that. 
And yet, that's basically the story of we running away from God and God continuously running after us. That's why the Father is a loving Father. No matter how sinful we become, the Father will always be there willing to forgive us. We just have to return. That's actually the challenge. When will we return? The Father was only able to run to the Son because the Son returned. Now, my dear friends, let me conclude with this. As I have said in the beginning of our reflection, when we say Lenten season, this is the time when we remember, we reflect on what? The suffering and death of the Lord. But, during this Lenten season, when we just always say, it's like, Oh, look at Jesus. He carried the cross to Calvary. He's, he experienced all the hurts and pains and everything like that. Oh, he died on the cross. And then we start to cry. Oh. When we remember this is the suffering and death of the Lord, we miss the point. Remember that there is something greater than the suffering and the death. And what is that? The love of God for us. All these things happen because He loves us. And that is greater. That is greater than the pain and the suffering. If the love of Jesus for us is less than the pain and the suffering, He would not have carried the cross to Calvary. Do we have a proof to that? Do we have a proof to that? That is love and love of the Father is greater than suffering and death. That's why it happened. Do we have a proof of that in the Bible? Holy Thursday night. What happened on Holy Thursday night? Garden of Gethsemane. What happened in the Garden of Gethsemane? What did he say? Father, if it is possible to remove this cup of suffering before me, and then the Bible tells us, and then he had sweat of blood. Okay? I don't know, I really want, until every time I'm remembering that line, I always want to go back to how I wish I could have a chance and capability to go back to the Hebrew Bible or the Greek Bible. If, what, if the exact words is sweat of blood. Because we Filipinos, we have our own saying, right? What do we say? Not sweat. We don't use sweat. We use tears of blood. Lumuha kapan ang You know, when I was a child, I hear that from my mom. I think I used my mom too much tonight. I, I hear that from my mom. Because life was very difficult. If there are special occasions, sometimes I would approach my mom and say, Mom, can I buy new pair of shoes? She said, no. You don't have money. Mom, please, I'm going to buy a pair of new, new pair of shoes. No. And then what will the child do after asking for how many times? Will cry. What will my, my mom say? Kahit lumuha ka pa ng dugo. Even if you shed tears of blood, which means that means you really bent up to the point of it's already blood coming out of your eyes. She will not give it. In the version in the Bible, Jesus had sweat of blood. What does that mean? That means he really begged the Father, Father, please, if you can remove this cup of suffering before me, remove it. And yet, what did Jesus say? But if it is your will, let it be. That means His love of the Father is greater than the pain, the suffering, and even death on the cross. That's why I love you to say, it's really true that the pain, the suffering, and death of the Lord save us. But I would say, go beyond that. It's the love 
and fidelity of Jesus to the Father that saved us. It's the love of the Father that saved us. That's why, my dear brothers and sisters, in this Lenten season, as we walk with Jesus to Calvary and we remember, we refresh in our memory the suffering and death of Jesus on the cross, let us not lose sight of the bigger picture of the great love of Jesus for us and the love of the Father for us, that He was willing to accept suffering and death on the cross. I have shared this already with you. Remember my favorite frame, I always tell you, it's my favorite frame, which I saw in my, dent my dentist clinic back in the Philippines, who is not even Catholic. Every time I sit in his chair, dental chair, right in front of me is the frame. Here on Guam, when you go to a dentist, when you sit in his chair, you see TV screen, right? But in his, in his clinic, it's different. When you sit in his dental chair, when he reclines you like that, you see a frame. And what's the frame? Of Jesus at the cross. And the boy by the foot of the cross asking the question, Jesus, how much do you love me? Jesus stretched his hands on the cross and said, This much. This much. My dear brothers and sisters, as we reflect on the suffering and death of the Lord, let us be reminded of the great love of Jesus and the Father have for us. All that we have to do is actually respond to that love. And in this Lenten season, there is no better way to show your love for God and love for Jesus than to be reconciled with Him. From the very moment that we have been running away from God, don't ever forget that God has been searching for waiting for us. I hope this Lenten season will not pass and end without the Father catching sight of us from a distance. Let me repeat that. I hope this Lenten season doesn't end or doesn't pass without the Father seeing us from a distance. Because it is only when the Father sees us from a distance can He run to us and embrace us. When will you ever return to your Father? Loving Father, we thank you for this moment that we have gathered together as we strive to reflect on the mystery we celebrate in this Lenten season, especially as we enter into Holy Week when we celebrate on Sunday. Loving Father, help us to feel your love and care for us. It is easy to be talking about your love for us. But it's very difficult for us to truly experience it in our life. Make it real in our life, loving Father, in the many things that happen in our day-to-day -day life. May we truly see and feel your great love for us, so that we can truly respond to your love. May this Holy Week, this Lenten season, be an opportunity for us to, to express and feel that love so that we can also go back to you. Give us the wisdom, give us the inspiration and the courage to be reconciled with you through the sacrament of penance. I lift up to you, my brothers and sisters here, including all of their loved ones, most especially perhaps their loved ones who have been away from you. Loving Father, in this Lenten season, we ask you to send the Holy Spirit upon them. Enlighten them. Give them the inspiration to go back to you 
and to realize that without you, they are nothing. And so, loving Father, I ask you to bless all of us here and all our loved ones in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good night. Thank you very much.